Recording in progress. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Earth to Class. This is our 229th, if my calculations are correct. And this morning, we're very happy to welcome back Dr. Joachim Goes. Just before he heads off to the Arabian Sea to do research, he's going to talk to us about shrinking snow caps and rising tides, the response to the Arabian Sea ecosystems to climate change. So before I turn it over to him, I'd like to uh, share a little information with you. There's three parts to this presentation, geographic setting, monsoons, and satellite observations of plankton. I hope this will give you sufficient information to understand some of what he has to say. Just as a reminder, India was recently recognized as the world's most populous nation. So understanding factors that impact the physical environment of India is very important to hundreds of millions of people. The Arabian Sea is located as part of the Indian Ocean. It's in the northwest part of the Indian Ocean. It's bounded on the north by Pakistan, Iran, and the Gulf of Oman, and the west by the Gulf of Aden, the Gardafui Channel, and the Arabian Peninsula, on the southeast by the Lakadive Sea and the Maldives, on the southwest by Somalia, and on the east by India. Total area is given here is 3.8 million square kilometers. Its maximum depth is about 4,600 meters. Maximum width is 2,400 kilometers. The largest feeder river is the Indus. The Romans knew of this as uh, the Mara Erythraeum. The Arabian Sea has been a significant trade route since ancient times, and it's a very important source of moisture for India from the summer monsoons. So here's another picture of the area, which I suspect not too many of us know. Second part of this talk talks about the monsoons. These are seasonal winds that have been known for thousands of years. They are caused by the difference in temperature between the water and the land. In the summertime, the land is very hot, so air rises, and we get the uh, summer monsoons, which are the wet seasons. In the winter, the land cools, the waters are warmer, and the winds reverse and blow off shore from the land towards the sea. The monsoons are the major source of moisture to grow crops in India. And although we're talking about it for the Indian Ocean, the same sort of monsoonal pattern takes place in many other parts of the country, including in the Southwest of the US. So this again says that in the summertime, monsoon created trough, which is a heat source. And so the surface airflow is towards India. In the wintertime, the Siberian high, the winds blow in the other direction. Third part of my talk is going to be about studying plankton from space. We all know that ships at sea can tow nets behind them to collect organisms. But uh, because this is such vast areas, scientists have discovered ways of using the uh, wavelengths that are observable from space. For more than 20 years now, NASA has had 
a uh, satellite called Aqua. And Aqua has instrumentation on it so it can detect the wavelengths which are captured in pigments that the microorganisms have. So they have a sense of how much there are. Aqua is one satellite in something called the A-Train, which is a play on the tune from Duke Ellington. But the A here means afternoon train. And NASA has lined up a whole series of satellites that go over the same areas in the afternoon every day. I have more information about Dr. Goh's previous talk, which was nine years ago here. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to Dr. Goes. Okay, he's starting his screen share, that's good. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Everything looks fine. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so today, um, what I'm going to do is take you on a journey to um, the Asian subcontinent, um, India, Pakistan, Iran, and many of the countries that um, Mike has spoken about. And when we talk about climate change, uh, we have seen uh, its manifestations here over the last five or six years in a big way. You might have heard in November of uh, 2022, that's just last year, um, the fisheries uh, survey uh, showed that uh, all the crabs in the Bering Sea had disappeared. Uh, more than a million crabs were no longer there. And so it's a sign uh, uh, of things that are happening in different parts of the world. Um, we are seeing uh, changes happening on the east coast of the United States. Um, the Gulf Stream is slowly migrating northwards. So it's, uh, it means that warmer water is coming up north. And uh, the lobsters no longer ha have uh, their larvae to settle down and find their sweet spots to grow. So the population is migrating northwards. And we have seen that the lobster industry in Connecticut, New Hampshire, is, um, even um, Massachusetts is slowly uh, being decimated. Whereas um, we have seen uh, lobster landings increase in places like Maine and in Canada. So this is a sign that uh, tells us that we are slowly having shifts in ecosystem taking place all over the world. What I'm going to do today is going to talk about the changes that are help, happening in, in another place, in other places of the world. And I'm focusing especially on the Arabian Sea because this is where I, I've done a lot of work over the last uh, 20 years or so. So uh, just before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, my funding sources, the National Science Foundation and NASA here. And we have been collaborating on this project with several individuals from India and from uh, Oman. Um, and um, we have special ties with the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries Wealth. Um, and uh, it's in line, what we are doing there is in line with um, our university uh, president's uh, uh, fourth purpose of universities, uh, which says that science and knowledge developed in academic institutions should be for the uh, betterment of the welfare of people uh, all around the world. So with this in mind, um, we have been working to try and use this data that we've been collecting over the years and the science and knowledge that we've been um, developing over the years uh, to, um, to do something that could help uh, populations that are being impacted. And I must acknowledge that um, most of the work that we do in the lab is thanks to the summer high school students that we have in our lab every summer. They do the experiments and produce the data that we need for uh, running our models. So if you have any, um, you know, science students uh, who are interested in doing research, please contact Mike or me. Uh, we have uh, several of them coming to our lab every summer. 
So uh, just to give you a global perspective of uh, the Arabian Sea, you can see in terms of real estate, its footprint is very, very small. So why should a country like the United States be even worried or bothered about this place, which is so distant and so remote from where we are? Um, Mike showed you that, um, told, mentioned about the population in India going to 1.4 billion. Um, so India has surpassed China now and is uh, one of the highest, of high, highly, most highly populated countries in the world. But um, what I showed in arrows is the impact of the monsoons. Um, about one third of the monsoons uh, is affected by this monsoonal, uh, uh, you know, changes that happen on a seasonal cycle. And most of these countries that are downstream of the uh, Indian monsoon are agricultural economies. So if we have a failure of the monsoons in any given year, it affects the food security of these countries. And when we have issues of food security, energy security, we have problems that uh, come back to haunt us even in the United States. Um, India, since about 2005, has been having very erratic monsoons. So every year we hear flooding happening in India. And there's a reason for this, and I'll go into it a little bit later. And um, when this happens, uh, um, it is chaos. Um, and these are just examples from the last few years. Um, this was in 2009 in Mumbai, uh, where we had um, a flood that uh, completely shut down uh, the, um, the financial institutions over there and India lost a lot of money. In uh, 2014, we had a flood that came through a town and wiped out an entire city. Uh, and this is because the river actually, with the floods had changed its course. And you can see even the statues being carried away by the, uh, by the um, river. And this was in Kashmir where we never get floods. Um, we see it decimated a uh, little town over here. And this was in 2018 in Kerala. Now, why is this region important? Uh, so the Arabian Sea is actually the gateway to the Middle East, the oil rich Middle East. And any unrest in any given year, if there's unrest over here, it affects the trade of oil. So just to reiterate what Mike said, uh, so the monsoons, um, they're seasonal, they reverse their direction on a seasonal basis. So in summer, when the subcontinent is very, very hot, there's a low pressure that is created over here. And because the seas are a little cooler, the winds blow from the southwest direction. You can see over here in uh, June, July, August, it starts. And they blow towards the coast of uh, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and all these other countries in the vicinity. And they bring rainfall to India. And as they bring rainfall to India, you can see uh, this is um, a wind vector superimposed on SST, sea surface temperature images from satellites. And you can see the blue colors represent cold water. So as this winds blow along the coast, the water is moving the right, uh, at right angles to the wind direction. It's called Ekman uh, pumping. And they, as the waters move offshore, the surface waters move offshore, there's deep waters, which are, is colder waters that come to the surface. And these colder waters actually give rise to um, blooms of phytoplankton. So this is the coastal upwelling that happens along the coast of Somalia, Yemen, and Oman. So this is a very highly productive area. Now in winter, when you have the subcontinent cold, you have the winds coming from the mountains over the sea. Okay, And I'll just go back to it. And during this time, the winds are cold very, very cold coming out from the Himalayan Tibetan plateau. And they cool the surface waters over here. And the cooling actually causes the waters to become denser 
it sinks down and you have the same process by which nutrients are brought to the surface. So this process, unlike coastal upwelling, is called convective mixing. So it's a thermal process that changes the density of the waters. The waters become uh, dense and heavier, and so they sink down, and you have bottom waters that come up to the surface. So this wind um, reversal drive one of the most energetic current systems in the whole entire globe, okay? and they have a huge influence on phytoplankton productivity and carbon fluxes that settle to the ocean, uh, the ocean sea. And as uh, Mike mentioned as well, it, this intensity of the winds is regulated by the thermal gradient between land and the sea. So I just have this fun fact over here. From 1990 to 1995, the US government spent about $50 million uh, on a program called Joint Global Ocean Flux Studies, with several, about 21 countries were involved in this study. They wanted to study how the reversal of the monsoon affects this ecosystem. And so just to show you in a schematic before we go to the main talk, um, this is now superimposed on an image of ocean color, one of the, and this, what the maps that you're seeing are that of chlorophyll. So when winds blow in this direction, I said this area gets very, very cool because of coastal upwelling. You have a lot of uh, phytoplankton blooms that develop and it supports the rich fisheries in this area, okay? So um, you can see at, at this time of the year, the snow caps have shrunk, okay? Uh, the Indian subcontinent is very warm and you have this pressure gradient that actually contributes to this um, land ocean, uh, ocean land uh, movement of air. In, uh, so in, uh, sorry, in 2005, uh, we noticed for the first time the, the, the snow caps in the Himalayan mountains were shrinking. They become smaller and smaller each year. And uh, we found out to be able, were able to establish this connection that, uh, between the snow caps shrinking and the Arabian Sea becoming more productive. So as I said, uh, if you have more snow in the Himalayan mountains um, that are remnant in summer, uh, the winds going out from the sea are weaker. So the pressure gradient is a little less steep, but now we have the snow caps that have melted and these winds are becoming stronger and they're bringing more rainfall to India. But at the same time, they're also changing the ecosystem of the Arabian Sea, it's making it more productive. So when did this all start? Um, so this started around uh, the late 1990s. Okay, so this is a map, um, a time series of um, air temperatures over the Eurasian continent, okay? And uh, you can see from the 1960s to 1995, from where these records are available, uh, it is pretty steady. We have had little ups and downs, um, and that is normal. Some years you have an El Nino event, some years you have something else that is happening. But since the late 1998 or so, uh, we've been having a sudden shift in the temperatures over Eurasia. And these are anomalies, okay? So this is, uh, this would be, if nothing were changing, this would be close to zero. If it were decreasing the temperatures, it would be below um, zero. And if it is higher now, as we see now, it is about 0.5 degrees uh, higher than normal over Eurasia. And there are estimates now that says that this goes up to 2015. The current estimates are about 1.5 degrees higher than normal. So this change happened around 1998. And what has happened since then? Okay. So um, in the past, we used to have more snow over the Himalayan mountains. Okay. And as I said, when you have more snow, the pressure gradient between the land and the sea is weaker. And you have weaker southwest monsoon winds. Okay. So if you have weaker southwest monsoon winds, you have weaker upwelling along the coast. So there's less cold water, nutrient-rich water coming up. And um, you have weaker phytoplankton blooms. Now, just to give you some perspective, we have less snow in the Himalayan mountains. The pressure gradient between the land and the sea has increased. You have stronger west southwest monsoon winds. 
you have colder water coming up, so this upwelling has become stronger, and you have more phytoplankton blooms. So you would think, um, and as any layperson, even I thought that it would be good for fisheries. Okay, but the Arabian Sea has got a dead zone. Um, does anyone know which are the other places that have dead zones? Uh, you're free to interrupt me, okay, during my, converse, uh, my talk. So we've heard of a dead, a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico as well. So this is a zone where there's oxygen concentrations are very, very low and there's no fish or animals can survive in it. So the Arabian Sea has got one of these. There's one off the coast of Peru as well. And we have predicted in 2005 that it, if, if this warming trend continued and the snow caps were, uh, would shrink, that we would have more phytoplankton plumes but the carrying capacity, there are not enough zooplankton to feed so much on so much of food. And the Arabian Sea is landlocked to the north. We predicted that it would increase the size of the oxygen minimum zone. So you have a lot of organic matter that is unconsumed by, uh, by zooplankton. So it sinks down, bacteria act on it, and then this bacteria takes away the oxygen from the system and this oxygen minimum zone increases. Now, this is the situation in winter. Okay, so we have the snow caps um, are covered with snow uh, and um, you have cold winds coming from the Himalayan Tibetan plateau that go over the Arabian Sea, cool up this water and you can see the increase in phytoplankton from space actually uh, that is caused by this process called winter convective mixing. So, if you look at the amount of snow that the Himalayan mountain has lost, it is almost about uh, 200,000 square kilometers that it has lost, okay, since 1998. So these changes are happening very, very rapidly. Uh, and at the same time, you see, this is the amount of chlorophyll that is there in the Arabian Sea uh, since 1997. And uh, this is, again, from satellite data. If you look at the integrated value of chlorophyll that is there in the Arabian Sea, you can see over time, both during the southwest monsoon and during the northeast monsoon, the chlorophyll concentrations are going up. And I can't tell you uh, how much, it's almost about threefold that the chlorophyll concentrations have increased. But this, as I said, is not good for fisheries because it is causing the expansion of the oxygen minimum zone. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is actually uh, about this process of changing winter convective mixing. So again, in the schematic, we see that when the, in winter, when you have more snow of the Himalayan mountains, the pressure gradient is from the land to the sea, and you have colder and drier winds coming out from the mountains, and they blow over the sea. And so you have strong winter convective mixing and more phytoplankton. What we see now is this situation, okay? So we see less snow and the winds have become warmer and more humid. And again, from satellite data clearly shows these patterns. The convective mixing has also weakened. Okay, so you would expect more, less phytoplankton instead of more. So weaker winter convective mixing, less phytoplankton. And in the past, uh, this area used to be full of these organisms called diatoms. They're very easy to see under the microscope. They've got geometrical uh, shapes and they're rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids and they're good for fisheries. So I told you that the chlorophyll concentrations should have decreased because of the weaker winter convective mixing as shown in this yellow line, if what I said was true. But instead, during winter, we are seeing an increase in chlorophyll completely opposite to what we had predicted, that the chlorophyll would decrease during winter. Instead, we are seeing an increase. And, and again, this is from the perspective from high above um, us. Uh, these are satellite images. The reds uh, show you areas of very high chlorophyll. So if you look at 1998, February, you can see that the chlorophyll concentrations, the blues are less, um, chlorophyll, so these are unproductive waters as you go up north, the waters become productive. And the reds, as I said, are highly productive areas. 
But you can see since 1998, the satellites really show that this area is becoming more and more productive. It of course varies from year to year. Uh, but just to give you some perspective of how big this area is, um, this area of the Arabian Sea is three times the size of Texas. Okay, and I'll come to it later. And in, in the uh, early 2000s to about uh, the late um, 2010s, uh, mid 2010s, so about 2015, we have had no ships going into that area because of the piracy problem. And so we have been going on Indian ships to this area to study, and that's why we developed this partnership with India to study these waters. And the first cruise that I went on in 2009 um, shocked me beyond words. So what we were seeing here is this blooms of phytoplankton. And it was, so thick, this is like we were in, um, you know, off the coast of Florida and, you know, sometimes in, the, um, in Long Island Sound, but you never see these conditions in the open ocean. And if you see the color of the water, you can see this algal bloom floating at the surface, stretching for miles. And I said it occupies an area that is about three times the size of Texas. And if you drop a net in the water, Within two minutes, you see this green color pea soup. So this is the organism that has appeared. It's not a diatom. It's a new organism that has appeared. It's almost monoalgal. And I'll give you uh, some, and we are the only lab in the world that has it in culture now. Um, so it's a bulbous organism. It's about one millimeter in size. So pretty big compared to a normal phytoplankton. And it has got these tiny little organisms uh, inside, and I can just play this, and you can see this tiny little organism. It's a chlorophyte, okay, and it's called Proto-Euglena noctiluci. And this organism evolved about 1.2 billion years ago. It evolved in an atmosphere that was high in CO2 and low in oxygen. So now that it is coming in contact with low oxygen waters, this organism is growing like crazy. So we have seen in laboratory cultures um, that when you grow this organism um, in the lab, it grows better in low oxygen conditions. And this is oxygen that we garnered from the past historical shipboard data. You can see the Arabian Sea was completely saturated with oxygen till about 1998. And after 1998, as we had said, the oxygen content in the Arabian Sea has gone down. And you can see this, the yellows are the diatoms. So uh, before the 1998s, we had diatoms. And suddenly we are seeing the appearance of this organism called Noctiluca. And as I said, it, uh, these are work by students in our lab. They come and do these experiments. Um, and you can see that at uh, pre-industrial levels of CO2 versus uh, present day and future, you can see this organism not only growing happily, uh, but it is also becoming bigger in size when you grow it under high CO2, low oxygen conditions. So what is causing the spread of um, the oxygen minimum zone? I told you one of the reasons is the Arabian Sea is becoming very highly productive, but there's another reason, humans are impacting it. So these are the currents around the Arabian Sea, and I want to you to look at this reversal of the monsoons that takes place. Okay, so during winter, so as we approach winter, the waters come around uh, Sri Lanka and they move up northwards. And as they move up northwards, they carry all this untreated sewage water that countries like India and Pakistan are releasing into the into the Arabian Sea. Similarly, on this coast, these are all developing economies. Uh, Dubai is the past many, many countries in terms of its GDP, uh, then you have Qatar, and all these countries release a lot of uh, sewage, some of it which is untreated. And if you pull this all up, it's a lot of uh, sewage that is getting into the Arabian Sea. So this is again work by students in our lab. They found out uh, typically diatoms grow in nitrate, 
And this is again under fluorescence microscope, the same noctiluca, you can see the outer um, membrane of the host cell, and you can see this little, uh, a tiny little uh, organism, the presinophyte that I spoke about growing inside. And you can see the moment you supply it with a different nutrient source, a nitrogen source, in this case nitrate, ammonium, which um, we all humans produce as a waste product, and urea, you can see this organism becomes bigger and grows better under urea conditions. So it tells us that human waste is having an impact on this ecosystem. So um, what we have seen is this organism cannot be eaten by normal zooplankton. The only thing that eats it are these jellyfish and salps. And just to give you some perspective, you can see this organism ingesting the noctiluca. And they form these pellets over here. Uh, and, uh, and within uh, um, about half an hour, a completely a green colored bucket can be transformed into uh, colorless water because they graze so fast on these organisms. But this is how, what happens along the coast. This is at a desalination plant. Uh, this is the intake of a desalination plant, and every year they have these huge swarms of jelly, uh, salps and jellyfish that appear along their coast, and it clogs the intake of these um, desalination plants. So uh, they have water shortages in that country, so water security is a huge problem because of these blooms. And this is what I will be shocking to you. Instead of fish, now we are seeing jellyfish. And this is all jellyfish. This is from this region, just off uh, the, the Straits of Hormuz. And this is, uh, was sent to us by a fisherman in that area. And this is off the coast, the southern coast of Oman, this place called Salala. You can see this jellyfish all along the coast. And the fishermen, um, this is again the intake of a uh, desalination plant. You can see all this jellyfish. Here is one engineer trying to clear out this jellyfish. But at sea, you can see the nets are full of this jellyfish. So um, we have been working very closely with the government of Oman. And um, the Navy uh, views these blooms, these green tides that we are seeing as a national security problem because it affects the endurance at sea. And so uh, the moment you have this jellyfish and these blooms, they cannot take water into their intake in the ship because most ships use desalination water for, for producing fresh water. So instead of the 20 or 30 days that they stay out at sea, they actually can stay only for 10 days. So these people cannot patrol their coastal waters, which as I said, is a gateway to the oil-rich nation in the Middle East. It affects aquaculture farms, it affects refineries and desalination plants. I'm just giving you some few examples. Tourism is also impacted by this. And this bloom has been spreading, and this is off the coast of India in November 2022. You can see, you can see this bloom uh, appearing in November. And this is what it has been doing to the Indian coast as well is the sign. So this oxygen minimum zone is expanding. Their habitat is getting constricted. And all the fish are coming to the surface, but they're washing ashore. So almost every year, they find this massive amounts of fish. And these are sardines that come to the shore. Yes, yeah, so just to uh, bring back um, what has been happening. So in the past, under normal conditions, we had phytoplankton, we had zooplankton, we had fish, and we had few um, noctiluca, but those were red in color, and we had few jellyfish. It's not that they were not there. Now, because of climate change and human activities, we are seeing this warming trend, enhanced stratification. I said the oxygen minimum zone is spreading, the ocean is becoming more acidic, and the nutrient stoichiometry uh, so we are seeing more ammonium and urea in the waters as compared to before. And this is giving rise to these huge blooms of noctiluca. It's giving rise to salps and jellyfish. And the only consumers of uh, salps and jellyfish are turtles and squid. 
and um, squid are not a, a preferred food for in the Middle East. Um, all of this is exported, so they have they are having a decrease in fish landings. Um, but uh, what you will see this uh, food web has changed from a highly energetic um, food web where you had a lot of moving fish with rich in proteins to this low energy food web where you have jellyfish which have less proteins. They are they only drift in the water. Their movements by their tentacles is very very slow compared to fish, okay, and so does turtles. They move very. So we are seeing this high energy food web transforming into low energy food web. So what are we doing about this? I told you about the fourth purpose of the uh, uh, Columbia University is to use science for the welfare of human population. And so we have been trying to develop this real time forecasting system uh, for the government of Oman. And for this work, I partnered with the Navy the US Navy, which has got an operational model, circulation model that they use for guiding their uh, fleet in this region. So uh, this model is very, very accurate because they need to, um, you know, uh, help with the ship operations. So the area that we have been concentrating is this area of uh, Oman called Muscat. This is the Sea of Oman. And just to give you some perspective, by February, you see this bloom is so thick that you see the color of the water completely transform. And this happens every year, every year. Before the 2000s, they never saw this. And so um, I've just taken some examples of what this model does. So around uh, 2019 of October, they had a massive fish kill. And you can see the sardines in a harbor along this coast somewhere around here. And so they wanted to know what killed this fish because there were no blooms during this time. It was too early. October is too early for this bloom to occur. What we found out is that the slow oxygen waters that had upwelled over here were being pinched off from the coast and were being transported into the Sea of Oman. And they were accumulating in this region, in the bays in this region. So this model that we have developed actually can you can use traces to find out where the source water is. So we were able to find out that this source water was somewhere here. This low oxygen water was being pinched and taken into the Sea of Oman and being deposited in all the bays where this fish kill was being observed. So sometime in uh, the, uh, June of 2020. 29, there were two ships, oil tankers, that were bombed by Iran. And the Omani government asked us whether our system could help them uh, to predict whether the oil would come to their coastline. And so we could use the tracer technology that we've developed in this model, dropped tracers in the water, these are passive tracers. And we found out where the ships were bombed, where the ships were leaking, and we found out that, um, you know, the trajectory of those that oil spill. So you can see little particles over here that slowly start moving towards the coast of Oman. So we gave them the, um, the estimated time of arrival of this oil to their shoreline. And so they could move some of their assets like aquaculture, farms to other areas. And then this model has also been used for cyclone predictions. So the Arabian Sea, as I said, is becoming warmer. They are seeing more cyclones. So you can see the cyclones developing off the coast of India and moving slowly towards the coast of Oman. And in this case, we had predicted that it, instead of hitting Oman, it would go to Yemen. And this is exactly what had happened. There was another cyclone that followed, and we had predicted that it would turn its course and go towards Pakistan and India. And that is what happened. So this model has got many, many um, applications. And we use it for predicting this outbreaks of noctiluca blooms in the Arabian Sea. So if you look at it from space, this is what the bloom looks like. Uh, this is a true color image. If you are in an aircraft and you stop below, this is what the Arabian Sea would look like. So I'll end this talk um, on this note that you can see these beautiful images from space. <laughs> but it, these organisms are bioluminescent. And so if you look at 
stand on the shore in Oman or any of these countries like Iran, you can see the waters turn blue at night. And um, yeah, it does look like this famous painting of Van Gogh, Starry, Starry Night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joachim. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll be open to questions. Do we have any questions from participants? We're not seeing anything similar in other seas, are we? No, we see them sporadically, um, but this has been happening consistently from 2000 onwards. So is this, this is, so I've been to many parts of the world. Uh, we do a lot of research uh, everywhere and there's nothing like this that I've seen that is so uh, tangible, you know, evidence that the ecosystem is changing. Um, this organism and, found only in the Indian Ocean? No, um, it is found off the coast of Vietnam, uh, most Southeast Asian countries actually, because they use a lot of fertilizer and fertilizer contains urea and ammonium. They use it for agriculture. And there's a lot of runoff happening in those waters. And so uh, the fertilizer that runs off actually gives rise to these blooms, but not on a scale as we see in the Arabian Sea. Hey, anybody can uh, unmute and uh, ask questions, please. So this is what's happening, say, in Chesapeake Bay, where you get the blooms, and then yes. they sink to the bottom, and they decay and deplete the water of oxygen. oxygen. Yes, exactly. It happens in the Gulf of um, Mexico as well. We have huge problems off the West Coast as well, because you have a lot of hypoxic waters that are coming up. You're having these huge blooms. Sometimes they're toxic blooms. And it's slowly decimating the Dungeness uh, crab population. It is decimating the salmon population over there. Um, but it happens on you know, a seasonal cycle. Uh, sometimes you have a stronger upwelling happening and more hypoxic waters coming to the surface. But in the Arabian Sea, we have seen this trend that is consistent and it matches up so well with the warming trend that is happening, the shrinking of the snow caps. And so it is a clear sign. It's the first time that we've made such a strong connection between global warming, human impacts, and what is happening to ocean ecosystems around the world. Yeah, there was a, an article in the Times about, because India said so, uh, is the most populous country, and the farmers apparently are very, uh, because of the changing climate, they're very insecure about their crops being, a, you know, being able to supply the food. Yes. So um, Mike mentioned at the start of the talk that I was heading to India, uh, to the Arabian Sea actually. And the US Navy, uh, NASA and NOAA have partnered with the Indian Space Research Organization with the um, uh, Ministry of uh, Environment. And we have this massive um, uh, project going to happen in June in the Arabian Sea. Because uh, the Arabian Sea is about 1.5 degrees warmer than what it was about 10 years ago. And because it has become warmer, the prediction models that they use in India and which was supplied to them by NOAA do not work anymore. So their ability to predict the onset of the monsoons has gone down. So the US Navy um, has decided to partner with NOAA and NASA to try and see whether we could collect data to find out whether we could do a better job of improving the predictions of these monsoons. So yes, it is really important that they get the monsoonal uh, timing right because that's, Depending on that, they plant their crops. Exactly. So if the monsoons are delayed or advanced by a few days, it has a huge impact on the early uh, seeds that they sow. And it could either kill the crop at the beginning or flood the entire, uh, you know, the fields and destroy the crops. So it has a huge impact on food security. And that's why the US government is contributing so much uh, to this effort.
Are you training some of the scientists at Indian universities? Yes. Um, so um, there will be two Indian ships, and there will be uh, one U.S. ship. I'll be on the U.S. ship, but there are many Indians, young scientists who are going to be joining. So uh, one of the uh, ideas behind this program is also to develop capacity. So capacity building and education are two important uh, aspects of this study. Excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I hope you'll have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I can leave now, Mike, isn't it? Yes, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you all for coming today. This yeah. is the last Earth to Class for this academic year, and we will be starting again in September. Yes, yeah, so just before I leave, I want to pitch uh, for students, if you have any bright students uh, who are interested in science, uh, technology, uh, please send them our way. Uh, we have uh, many of our students who have gone to do really well. And just last week uh, or two weeks ago, um, one of uh, two of our high school students won uh, STEM prizes at the um, uh, Regeneron competition. And one of them has been selected to go to Stockholm to present at the water conference. And her work was on an octiluca. She showed for the first time ever that they can ingest plastics. So <laughs> apart from this other problem that we're having that to deal with uh, climate, she has found out that it can also uh, play a role in plastic recycling. Okay, bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Okay.